about acoustics, sound. And sound is what also inspired our next inductee ever since he was a, uh, was a kid. Les Paul loved the sound of trains rattling on the tracks, and he should be here right next to the tracks, um, of the walls and furniture when he banged on them with sticks. So it's not surprising that Les changed the sound of music. His solid body electric guitar, his unique playing style, his innovative amplifying and recording techniques inspired generations of musicians. Ask guys like Chet Atkins, Paul McCartney, Keith Richards, and Eric Clampton. They all played Gibson Les Pauls. Les told us that he was even working on a version of a solid body electrical classical guitar for the great Segovia before his death. Myself, I'm a jazz man, and that's the other passion I share with Les. So ladies and gentlemen, let's turn up the volume for the inventor of the solid body electrical guitar, born Lester Pulfris. He is famous to all of us as Les Paul. From far and wide, they flock to Times Square to pay homage to the master. And I came here about 3,200 miles roughly and I drove to see the man who's a living legend. The first solid body guitar. He's like the Thomas Edison of his time. Les, this is a 1960. I wonder if you'd sign the back of it. Oh, sure. Les Paul special. I got interested in guitar, and I heard about Les Paul, and I got excited, so I asked my mom, and she said it was okay to come down here and let me get my guitar autographed and meet him. At nearly 90, guitarist, music revolutionary, and inventor Les Paul still plays two shows every Monday with his trio at Iridium in New York. A generous performer, he loves sharing the stage with new talent. Good. This pioneer of the solid body electric guitar remembers one of his earliest inventions, a harmonica in a rack he could pivot with his chin. With your chin, you could change keys. Uh, no one else had that type of a harmonica. That was a real super invention of mine for a couple of days. <laughs> As rhubarb read, Les was playing his hillbilly guitar when a listener complained it wasn't loud enough. So Les made a pickup out of phonograph and telephone parts. But the guitar's hollow body produced distortion and feedback. So I filled it with rags and tablecloths and socks, shorts, anything I could get in my head. They went inside the guitar. It helped a little, but it didn't solve my problem. So then I thought, well, what I'll do is fill it with plaster Paris. So I filled it, that was the end of my guitar, by the way. It was a Sears Roebuck $3 guitar going to hell. <laughs> and it did. The ultimate solution, a solid plank of dense wood with strings and a pickup. But this log, as it was called, looked so weird, audiences didn't applaud, until Les stuck on wings to make it look more guitar-like. I went back to the same club and I played it. And lo and behold, everybody loved it. And so I says, well, the people here were their eyes. The unsightly log grew into the elegant Gibson Les Pauls, among the most sought-after guitars in the world. But Les didn't just create a new kind of instrument. He kick-started a musical revolution and moved the guitar player from backup to front and center stage. We were no longer a wimp. We now could stand up and outdo anybody in the band. We could just turn it up louder. Somewhere there's music. In the 1950s, using wife Mary Ford's vocals and his newfangled guitar, Les hit upon multi-tracking, which created a sound unlike anything heard before. I never could answer in a million years where those ideas come from. What 
two things that I knew helped to believe in God and to be in love. And if you have those two things and then maybe a beer. <laughs> and so a toast to the man behind these musical innovations. The National Inventors Hall of Fame is pleased to induct Les Paul. like to tell you how happy I am to be here tonight on Earth. <laughs> Seriously, of all my dreams, this is the last dream I never thought would happen, to be here and inducted into the Hall of Fame. I'm very grateful for everybody that believed what I did in my lifetime. And above all, I couldn't help but think, looking backstage, at how interesting it was that upstairs is mom and dad saying, my God, those kids are downstairs making all that noise. And the kids downstairs saying, if it wasn't for Les Paul, we wouldn't have this. <laughs> and I can't help but look back, not knowing at all that such a thing would happen where somebody drove into a drive-in theater and wrote a note to the car hop, a little barbecue stand, and it said, Red, your guitar and your harmonica are loud enough, but we can't hear the guitar. And I was singing into a telephone, playing through my mother's radio, working at this little barbecue stand near Milwaukee. And so I went home and told my mother that I'd find a way to make my guitar louder. And I filled it with socks and shorts, tablecloth, everything I could to muffle the sound so it wouldn't feed back. But that didn't work too well, so I filled it with plaster pears. And that worked a little better. So then I decided, well, none of these things quite fulfill what I'm dreaming about, what I will do is I will go down and take a big piece of railroad track that they removed because it was injured and string a string on it and that for sure is going to howl or feed back into the, phone, into the telephone. I didn't. It was a perfect sound. It was beautiful. And I went running to my mother and I said, Mom, I've got it. With this railroad track, I got the most beautiful sound. She said, Lester, the day you see a cowboy on a horse playing a piece of railroad track. <laughs> <laughs> so I tried a different idea, and I took a piece of wood, and I tried it with the piece of wood, and it was way too dense, way too uh, weak, uh, too flimsy not sturdy enough to sustain the notes. And so I knew I had a problem that it had to be a solid piece of wood that wouldn't vibrate, couldn't be metal because it was too heavy and mother was right. The horse and the cowboy just wouldn't work out. And so I came up with the solid body guitar 
And I took it to the largest manufacturer in the country, Gibson, handed it to them, and they said it was the character with the broomstick with the pickups on it. And they laughed at me for 10 years. And at the end of 10 years, Finally, I got a call from him saying, would you bring that contraption in? We'd like to look at it. And after 10 years, they decided to take a try at it and make this first solid body electric guitar. And the Gibson people, of course, from then on, were very successful in making the instrument. And the one thing I wanted to tell you is that at that same time, here's where the inventing came into being so prominent, and that is, is that I wanted to hear what I was doing, and everybody, like my mother, my brother thought I was nuts, so that didn't count. He just says, oh, he's at it again. But my mother, I had belief in what I was doing, and what I wanted to do is I wanted to hear when she said, Lester, that sounds good. I have no way of hearing it. And so I took a flywheel from the Cadillac down my dad's garage and the dental belt from my drummer, who was a dentist. And I made this contraption of an acetate recording method of recording and that satisfied me a little bit, but I wanted to hear it better and better and better. And so along came my good friend Bing Crosby, and he said to me one day, I've got something out in front for you. And I was the person that took the first idea of the tape machine to Bing Crosby to revolutionize the whole industry into playing something besides a disc or what few of us remember as a, re a phonograph record. And so what happened is that Bing said, I have something out in, the, in my car for you. So I went out and he opened the trunk and I'm expecting Kraft cheese or Philco radio, something like that. To my surprise, here was this box with the handles on it, and he and I carried it in the back, and it was a tape recorder. And when I saw the tape recorder, Mary was doing the laundry, and that was my partner and my wife. And while she was hanging the laundry and doing her thing, I was recording one of my little radio shows that I did every week out in California. And the idea struck me that if I put a fourth head there, I could do everything. Mary and I could do everything with one recording machine. So I called Ampex, told them to please send me another head. So they thought I blew a head. But what I was doing is placing a head in front of the three heads that come with the machine. And so we got, got in our station wagon and we're going across the country and Mary's saying over and over to me, she's saying, but what if it doesn't work? Oh, I says, I'm sure it'll work. I says, here, look at it, look at the paper. That didn't mean much to Mary because she kept saying it and saying it and saying it. And that went on until we were almost in Illinois and we were heading for Chicago. And I began to wonder if Mary wasn't right, that the thing wouldn't work. When we got to Chicago, the most wonderful thing happened, and that is the head was waiting for me. I called some friends of mine that I knew in Chicago. They come over with a drill. We put the fourth head on this three-headed machine. I said to Mary, just say something. So she's one, two, three, four, testing. And then I says, hello, I love you. Hello, hello, hello. And the both voices come back. 
and I was walking around with a crutch at that time, coming out of an automobile accident. I threw the crutch in the air, and Mary and I were dancing around the room, and we had in, we had in front of us the very first multi-track tape machine called Sound on Sound. And then it was three years later, from that came the big thing for us, and that was is to take the electric guitar and her voice and multiply it into a glee club and an orchestra. And with this new invention, which is called multi-track recording, we were able to multiply Mary's voice into a glee club and my guitar into an orchestra. And of course, that just changed the whole recording industry. And of course, I think it changed everything in the way where you have to do multi-track recording in sync. And this is one of the happiest things that happened in my life. And along came Echo and a few other things that we threw in for a good measure. And that made our whole lives change. And I only wished at this time that I was lucky enough to have Mary here to share this with me. But I wish to thank all of you that made it possible for us to succeed in what we were doing. Thank you.